Well, that was quite a season. Pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, it was great actually. It's um, you know, uh, season two flew by, and uh, uh, you know, I'm so happy that uh, that we had the chance to meet uh, these amazing individuals. Every single one of them uh, has a certain talent and certain uh, story that uh, that was really interesting to share. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think they are all insightful, to say the least. Every single episode. Yeah, and and you know, it's a uh, it's a wrap. Season two is done. Uh, you know, looking forward for season three, hopefully. And go by them episode by episode. What what stood out for you? Let's say in Rama's episode, first episode. So to me, uh, I mean, Rama's episode uh, was really insightful about all this part of te the technology and emerging technology that. Uh, uh, that's happening and uh, it's actually the future in my opinion. So when you talk about you know deeply democratizing AI, can we dive a little bit more into this? Right now there are big players in the AI field, uh, the Amazons, the Googles of the world and uh, the, the deep pocketed customers, uh, whether it's the Exxons or Shells or others that can really afford to make use of this. So there's a, an existing bias that we're trying to solve for there where young entrepreneurs, startups, uh, artists that, uh, or communities like in the refugee community don't, and NGOs don't have access to AI. So that's the first point of deeply democratizing it is making it affordable and accessible to members of those communities. The second is, you know, we all are consumers of social media. We all volunteer our data to Facebook and all of the other uh, social media networks and don't get a return on our investment. Yeah, you know, she talked how, how she's democratizing uh, the AI, how she's creating a platform, which actually we're planning to work uh, with her on that uh, regard and, and trying to implement some of these uh, services uh, in, on our platform. Yeah, actually, I just checked out some of the stuff that they are doing with AI, and it's pretty incredible. I think that was totally an insightful episode. And, and also, not just the AI that she covered, but also all the other nonprofits that she's working with. I thought that's, um, that's very impactful. Exactly. And, uh, you know, she's a great example of Arab-American women leadership uh, role here, here in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm personally looking forward to, to host and meet uh, a lot of these leaders uh, in our future episodes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely think that was a great start for the season. And then we go for Donna, which was also a great episode. I mean, talk about entrepreneurship and about leadership, taking initiative, taking a lot of risk. I think her story was very inspiring. Actually, one of my friends just texted me yesterday saying, you know, anytime I'm looking for an inspiration, I'm going to be looking for Donna's episode. Shark Tank was just another thing we did that day. So yeah. one thing they taught us at the Accelerator is find 15 new ways every day to get your idea out there. Oh, wow. a lot. 15, 15 is a lot, but you know, when you start doing this exercise, that's a great exercise, actually. It's a, it's a fabulous exercise and you start getting a little bit desperate. And so you say, you know, today I'm going to try to reach out to Oprah. And so one day it was like, everyone says Shark Tank. Let's put that on there. You know, what are the odds? And then we had to send the video. And then a few months later, we were out in Hollywood filming, but we sort of rose to the occasion, got ready and we went from having, you know, a couple hundred subscribers, uh, and then the, by the end of that weekend, we had thousands. We had you know, over three thousand. We were doing over a million in sales in that weekend, and then it just kind of took off. The Shark there. Tank effect, as uh, the Shark Tank uh, effect. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Kevin O'Leary, the winner in Shark Tank. Uh, she had a great idea. She she believed in herself, and uh, uh, she succeeded, and and uh, she exited, and uh, she had the chance to work with with big investors like uh, like Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, and and a uh, really inspiring story uh, to, to whoever is uh, thinking about starting a business. I really recommend uh, uh, people to go back to this uh, episode and watch it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, I, I watched the Shark Tank episode and then fast forward, you hear about the success story when they sold the company and they made a deal with, with Kevin O'Leary, but you never hear about all the struggle that happened in between and how they came to get to the point where, where, where they got to. So that was great to hear that story. And I feel like it gives a lot of motivation for other entrepreneurs to not be discouraged when they get let down once and twice and, th and three times before they actually achieve what they're what they're going on. Moving forward to, uh, to Don Khoury, you know, to me, I, I've heard about uh, nonverbal communication and body language and all these uh, uh, terms and, and skills, but um, learning from the expert, about how to 
carry yourself in certain social uh, events, or sh a certain uh, aspect of your professional or personal uh, life. I came across some research uh, that actually was done at, at MIT that suggested or showed that how you dress and how you present yourself is a bigger indicator of whether you're going to get um, venture capital funding than what's in your actual presentation. And so, and they call what was called a target effect. And so I looked at, well, if there's a target, for whatever reason, I thought, well, there's a target effect on investors. There's also got to be a target effect on voters and how politicians uh, affect uh, voter decisions. And so I just did, you know, a lot of research into that and came up with an algorithm that predicted the election. Uh, it was crazy. It was like 95, 97%. A really interesting episode by, by Don. It totally works. I mean, a lot of the things that he said, I never thought about the way that he mentioned them, but once he mentions it, it just clicks. It just makes perfect sense how your, your nonverbal cues that you're offering without knowing are actually telling a lot about yourself until you're in a position where these cues don't really matter when you're in more established relationships personally or professionally. So that was definitely a, a great episode, actually. Yeah, Maya Berry, she's, she's the director of the, the Arab American Institute and um, 4 million plus uh, Arab Americans in North America. You know, the amount of influence and the amount of representation uh, uh, for our community is, is, is really interesting. And the, uh, the level of work they're, they're, they're doing and the, and the efforts they're doing in the Institute is really impressive, actually. I totally agree. I mean, this is a topic that's really you know, dear to me, I, I follow politics very closely and I, I've been following the Arab American Institute and the work they did. And, you know, I not only appreciated all the insights that she gave us, but also given a little bit of a historic perspective when she started talking about <clears throat> the first times when Arab Americans were engaged in elections and trying to lobby when she said about Lebanese for Nixon and then how Arabs started to get into elected positions and getting more and more organized until, and, until today. That was very interesting to hear the story and the progress of getting engaged with the community. In 1986, um, a city council member was running for, was running for mayor. And um, out of nowhere, a candidate uh, put out a flyer who was not well known, put out a flyer saying, let's talk about city parks and the air problem. City parks was a reference to the flag, the fact that um, uh, black members of our community, primarily from the city of Detroit, uh, were coming to use our parks. So one flag was black people. The city, the issue, the Arab problem was that we were sitting on our porches, um, that we, we would put furniture outside on our porches. We used to, to have large families, we'd use our outdoors and our garage more. So literally a candidate goes from talking about blacks and Arabs as being problems and, and he wins the race. Um, oh, wow. And at that time, they, we got a call from from our friends in Dearborn saying we we've got a problem here. This is this is incredible. The first thing we did is we came and we looked at the voter polls, the rolls, and, and you looked at the names. You have this community population with significant numbers, and you had hardly anyone registered to vote. And that's how you get to someone picking on you that way, <laughs> becoming the mayor of your city. Um, and one of the first things that happened then was a massive voter registration drive. Today, the majority of the city council in Dearborn is Arab American. The city council president is Arab American. There are, I think, I don't know, nine people running for mayor of Dearborn right now. <laughs> um, that's the story of, of, of success. The effort and the network effect between, between Arab Americans. Uh, you know, 40 million uh, people is not a small number and uh, with the right connection, the right uh, work towards a certain cause, uh, we can have a, a big effect in, in politics, in society and to improve our community. Yeah, that's for sure. It was interesting to hear actually that the majority of Arab Americans are in swing states. You know the information, but you never think about it that way. And once you know they're in swing states, you realize how much our vote matters. It's just about kind of organizing and presenting ourselves as a community with diverse opinions so it can appeal to all sides and, 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 you know, as a vote, this is a vote that really, really matters. Basim Youssef had an amazing success uh, back in the Middle East, in Egypt. You know, 30 million uh, views on every episode, uh, amazing success. Uh, and, you know, the circumstances happened and he had to move to the U.S. And uh, now the journey of how you reinvent yourself, how you... Uh, keep hustling and uh, keep looking for new opportunities to to make it here in the U.S. And of course, his field is very 
competitive, which is uh, uh, satire, political satire, and, and stand-up comedy, and all these amazing projects he's doing. Because at the end of the day, you're competing in Hollywood with it's the, it's the most cutting-throat industry in the world, and you 100%. have everybody competing. Everybody goes from mm-hmm. everywhere. And you're competing mm-hmm. with people who are uh, native, and, and like English native speakers, people like uh, uh, stars from all over the world, and mm-hmm. uh, it's tough. So, uh, and you also have to, uh, there is a psychological component here. The psychological component is you have to uh, make peace with your uh, current status. So mm-hmm. basically, uh, you have to, uh, to tell yourself, you have to humble yourself saying that what you did in Egypt, what you did in the Arab world is done. And you should not compare what you do here with what, what you've done there because it's going to be different. So mm-hmm. I was I get focused on succeeding in the United States, but not quantifying my success in comparison yes. with what I did in Egypt, because that is something doesn't happen. Uh, that rise was very exceptional. And uh, it doesn't make sense that I will make the same kind of success here in America. So I had to make peace that I am in a different journey than what I did in America, in America. That's why when people come and they say like, well, you did this this in Egypt, in, in, Amer- in Egypt and now look what you're doing in America, it's different. And I, I had to psychologically and, um, and, and, uh, and deal internally with the fact that I have actually to let go of what happened. It's like a chapter that happened and done and it's closed and it's not what I do anymore. Mm-hmm. So I started to do a lot of university uh, talks and do the speaker circles and I was doing that and then uh, I said I cannot just let go and that's be a speaker I have to do something else so I went back to comedy and this time to stand up comedy uh, and this is like was a huge leap because stand up comedy is difficult for Americans so uh, let alone having English as your second language and now you're having to speak to Americans about something that happened to you in a different country in a different climate. Mm-hmm. So that took its own kind of um, uh, of journey of me trying to uh, master the tools of this new art. You know what I like the most about Basim's episode is that <clears throat> he was so real with us. You know, like this is what he believed. You can tell this is what he really believes. Not trying to kind of play around it or or present it in any in a sugar coated way. It says you know this is what I believe. This is what my reality is. This is what my truth is, and that's what I'm going to preach. And I really appreciate that about him. And like you said, you know, coming from huge success to somewhere where you have to rebuild pretty much from scratch is a pretty tough place to be. And I think he is a great example of somebody who tackled that big time and is just going and going strong and, you know, diversifying, working on so many projects. It's just as an entrepreneur of sorts, you know. I'm really happy to and thankful to all our guests. They're, uh, you know, they were great. Uh, we learned uh, from each and every one of them. And, uh, you know, uh, really thankful for, for the season. And, of course, uh, for our, our amazing audience. Um, you know, we passed uh, 12K on Instagram. We, uh, we had um, hundreds of thousands of views on our episodes. And, uh, you know, we loved your, your, your comments, your, your feedback, your encouragement. The amount of messages we're getting uh, was really heartwarming and uh, the encouragement that, you know, to move forward and, and keep uh, uh, shedding light on um, success stories uh, of Arabs and Arab Americans in North America was really encouraging for us to, to do season three, basically. There's just a countless amount of people who are doing great work that deserve to be, to be highlighted. And it's just their, their story is a true inspiration for the community. And thank you guys again for your support and uh, looking forward to uh, season three. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it too. Thank you very much for your support and for all these people that took the time to watch us. It's really mind boggling to look at the numbers and see, you know, hundreds of thousands of people actually watching the content. It makes us feel a lot of responsibility to, you know, do, doing our best out there and highlighting the most interesting stories out there. And we look forward to season three. Uh, thank you so much. It's me, Anwar Gibran. And Malik Abdesalam.